It's Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern, so you know what that means. It's time for another. Oh, do we lose out? Events, the show where you get to ask the icons of the events industry anything. So you might be wondering, how do you get to ask questions? All you have to do is use the question panel on the right of GoToWebinars to submit your questions. Or you can hop on Twitter to submit your questions with the hashtag event icons. We'll be answering your questions live during the entire show. Before we get started, the more people we have watching, the better conversation we can have. So please help share hashtag event icons on Twitter and Facebook. Just tell your friends to watch at www.event-icons.com. Now, without any further delay, this is Hashtag Event Icons with your hosts, Will Curran of Endless Events, Laura Lopez of Social Tables, and Brant Kruger of Event Technology Consulting. Oh, yeah. Welcome, everyone, of Event Icons. If you're watching on the video, you got to see the lovely Alex Plax and make a guest appearance. Uh, I am lovely having technical difficulties today because I don't have any amazing co-hosts join me. Unfortunately, Laura and Brandt are out on assignment, as you all know. So we're going to be kicking Alex back here, who's going to be watching the Twitter watching conversation. The Twitter. And we are going to continue jumping into today's show. Today's topic is really awesome. It's a huge, huge topic in the events industry. And I know everyone is going to have a ton of questions about it. So don't want to delay too much. We're talking about event audience engagement and how can you make that more awesome so i brought two of the guys who i know know more about it than anybody else so uh so without any further delay i have to introduce first off sam smith sam is with social point like i i, I they do so much stuff they have so many platforms and technologies to be able to do audience engagement from different social media walls to games that you can incorporate literally everything so i i had to have sam sam is like the god of audience engagement Happy to have him here. Thank you so much for joining us, Sam. Hey, happy to be here. Happy to be here. <laughs> I'm happy we got the show working. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And al also joining me today, one of my favorite people in the events industry, uh, Uri Holbloom. Uh, hold up. Oh my gosh. I'm so all over the place today. See, that's what I get. It's karma for me getting your name wrong for all those years. <laughs> and Uri is with Slido. If you never heard of Slido, it is an awesome Q&A and polling platform for your events. Uh, we use a ton of our events. Literally, it's the best. doesn't require any apps. Literally, if you haven't heard of Slido, go check it out. And it's a great audience engagement platform. So thank you so much for joining us, Uri. It's so, so, so happy to have you here today. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's great to be here with you. Awesome. And I'm glad that we got you back on. We, we almost missed you that one episode. We're like, we have to have him back. <laughs> awesome. Well, I don't want to delay too much. I want to jump into the questions uh, and get rocking and rolling. So first of all, I want you guys to tell your stories as far as, you know, how you guys got in the events industry, because I know they're very, very interesting. Uh, so Sam, why don't you kick it off? Tell us what got you in the events industry. Yeah, um, it's, it's not that complicated. Um, I, I moved to Europe uh, in 2005, 2006, and I, I got on, um, I met some, the founders of a, a fascinating new startup called SpotMe. Um, at the time, it was a mobile device company, um, and now it's, it's like everybody else. There's, there's lots of event apps and does lots of things, and so um, I got into the industry there. And I worked there for several years. And then when I moved back to the United States, um, I started my own company. And we started as a consulting company where we were going to um, really focus on, well, and we did. We focused on designing um, audience engagement experiences and using lots of different types of technologies, right? And we designed some really fun events and really exciting events. And then along the way, we um, started building our audience engagement platform. And that's what Social Point is today is this platform really it's about you know there's not one way to do audience engagement there are lots of different ways to do that and so that's really what you know the the platform is all about is is you know this event you want to do this thing at that event you want to do that thing and it's one platform that allows you to kind of do all those things that you might want to do so can you give everyone a kind of an idea of the different types of way like obviously it has a lot of different tools in that toolbox yeah. what what sort of tools are in there obviously i mentioned you know social media walls but what other things can people look forward to if they're yeah using yeah i mean so we, we we think about things in three core three core types of solutions so interactive trade show games so we do lots of trivia Type games um, in physical spaces and in group rooms. Um, we do 
prize wheels, um, digital fish bowls, or excuse me, virtual fish bowls. We got instant win. Um, all that data flows into lead manager apps that tie together and really allow exhibitors to go from driving booth traffic to capturing leads to following up all in one step, right? They could do all that in the booth. So that's kind of one spot, right? And you think about a marketer, that's something they're doing. Um, we also have social media uh, engagement and some of our stuff. I've got some clients that think that our leaderboard and social media is probably the best one on the market. Um, but what we really try to focus on is how do you make things look beautiful and interesting? So you'll see really animated, fun, um, displays like we have a really cool thing going with George P. Johnson right now at, um, at Dreamforce. Um, really kind of fun, like old time. We took all the photos and made them look like they're old time photos in a campground book. That stuff's kind of fun. That stuff's a lot of fun. Cool. Um, but we can do we do that all over, right? You know, and it's really funny. You meet corporate people and they're like, I want this. What what anyone who's in ILEA would think is super boring. The corporate people are like, That's what we want. But in the ILEA, ILEA people want like something you know, snazzy and bouncy and, you know, whatever, all kinds of movement um, ties out the brand. So we do that. Um, we also do, um, we also have do audience engagement or audience response, right? So we have an audience response app and our stuff fits into twofold. One, we have the web-based device that you can do your surveys, your polls. We do brainstorming. We do um, caption this, word clouds, all these kinds of things, right? And if you think about it, and like this Slido does a lot of this too, right? It's really about creating dialogue. But the other thing that we did that's different um, is we also have kiosk-based stations. So we have a lot of people that aren't, they're, they're, you know, we have clients where they don't want people to just engage in the room. They want them to engage in a physical space. What will they do? So they can take content they might've created as a group, ideas they generated. And then we have touch screens that they can go up to and vote. Or if they want the privacy of a tablet, go do that. And so some clients, you know, you could do it all on a phone, but they're, that's not what they want. And so our technology allows them to do that. So like I have a, a really nice, interesting activation where they've got people going around to stations and they engage, but then that content is displayed on screens live and then they can change that remotely. And so for, for them, that's, that's what they want, right? And so our platform just allows you to do all those different things based on what your objectives are. Um, and you know, it's fun. It's fun. It's a lot of fun. I'm sure we'll talk a lot about like how fun can help with engagement. I think a little bit later on the show. Um, but before we do that, uh, I think everyone needs to know. So if you weren't in the events industry, what would you be doing instead? Oh, but Yuri didn't get to, an Yuri. Well, he gets next. He goes next. And then you, Oh uh, me, you want me. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Oh, sorry. I so selfless. <laughs> sorry. I was trying to pass the baton. Um, so if I wasn't in the events industry, what would I be doing? You know, I'm a, an entrepreneur at heart. I'm a, a technology person. I like the, um, you know, we, we are, we have a SaaS platform. And so, and so, and I like um, making people have fun, right? After doing what I've been doing for the last 10 years, I, there's no way I could go be a lawyer, right? Like, like people call me when they want to do, they call our company and talk to us about fun things they want to do and exciting things. And um, they, sometimes they want to know if it's possible. And so I, I would have a hard time um, doing, uh, doing being a lawyer or something like that. But I would probably do, you know, this might sound really boring, but I'd probably be in uh, digital signage or, di or what they call digital out of home in designing screen displays for that kind of stuff. And that's probably the kind of work we do. So if you kind of look at it, we're, we're actually just in the neighborhood, right, of, of that. Um, but those are some things I would do um, if I, if I wasn't doing what we're doing today. I love it. Entrepreneur at heart for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, Uri, uh, we, Sam almost kicked it over to you, but I had to stop him. But now <laughs> he's on finally your turn. I love, we love to hear what got you in the events industry, kind of history, what got you involved with Slido. Sure. So I'll just like keep it, keep it real short. So basically I got into the events industry uh, through Vietnam and Denmark, honestly. Uh, so there are basically two things that I really love. The first one is education and the second one is marketing. And why I mentioned Vietnam, there's a reason behind that. So after I completed my bachelor's studies when I was 22, I basically set out for the largest um, adventure of my life so far. So basically with my ex-girlfriend back then, we uh, packed our bags and went to Vietnam and we started giving the lectures over there and facilitating. We started facilitating some kind of a conversational and um, communication courses. 
And um, I never thought that I would be able to basically tap into this experience later on uh, in my current role at Slido. Uh, but before I actually started, started at Slido, I was studying in Denmark, uh, where I also got engaged with the marketing activities for the university. So I was doing all sorts of, you know, um, content marketing stuff and social media stuff. And that's another aspect that I really love um, and I'm very passionate about it. So in my current role, I get the chance to combine these two things basically. So it's, I can't imagine a better role, honestly, for myself at this point in my life. Um, so basically now moving towards uh, your second question, what I would be actually doing if I was not working for Slido, which I thoroughly enjoy. Uh, it's a tough question because I'm really passionate about the interactions, um, interactions between people in general or between the speaker and the audience. So most probably I'd be working in that area. And part of my job is already um, covering and doing and improving those interactions, uh, either through technology or through the moderation practice or through facilitation techniques and stuff like that. But I think there is one thing that I would love to, um, I would love to embark on at a certain point in my life and that's bike touring. I love cycling. So I would basically, uh, you know, hit the road on a bike and uh, circle around the, around the, around the globe. I think that that would be an adventure. I would be, I would be willing to, sort of, uh, you know, um, embark on. Awesome. I, I think spoken like a, a true Danish person to say like, you love cycling, right? Like, like yeah. every, the, probably the bike capital of the world. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, awesome. everybody loves cycling over there. So instead <laughs> of, you know, basically, um, traffic jams, you have a, a bicycle jam. So <laughs> they, you know, they definitely love it over there. I love it. Sam, go ahead. You're uh, Have you been to, I assume you've been to the tour de France. I haven't. Honestly, I haven't. It's on my bucket list, though. It's, it's for sure something to do. When I live in Switzerland, they came through one weekend, and, um, and it was pretty cool. Um, the other thing I would recommend, you look up a, a road race called Ragbrai, R-A-G-B-R-A-I. It's through a place that – it's through a, a state in the United States called Iowa, but it's a week long. You go from the Missouri River to the Mississippi River, and, and I did it with my dad one year, and it's 500 miles, uh, U.S. miles. Um, of biking for a week and it's just a lot of fun to kind of get out there and just meet a lot a whole bunch of people 10 over 10,000 people do it so it's just a lot of fun it's mostly eating right eating blueberry pie and things like that but it's so much fun Good time. Think, that's, we're that's, gonna have to do a great. bicycling event show, uh, episode soon talk about biking. yeah sorry about sorry to take <laughs> us off the path no but. it's it's all good um so um really quick uh you're right just so people can get a quick yeah. like 10 second intro into slido can you kind of explain what it is obviously it's talks a little about it's q a polling but you know can you explain a little bit how it works to everyone else that's ne maybe never heard of it yeah absolutely so basically slido is an audience engagement platform that allows you know even planners and meeting owners basically improve the communication and enhance the engagement uh, at the meetings or at the events primarily through two or three features basically the first one is they can collect and curate uh, basically top audience questions so you can you know have a more meaningful conversation and you know get you know create that kind of an impact that you wish with your event or a meeting and the second thing is um, it's about collecting the the feedback from the audience, you know, and, and, and having a conversation, having the feedback from 100 people, 200 people, sometimes 2,000 people sitting basically in the room. So um, the communication basically flows that both directions. Uh, either participants can submit the questions for the speaker or vice versa. The speaker can actually ask the audience a uh, question. And it all basically then comes down to how you implement these tools. So we are really getting to the meeting design um, era. Uh, it's the tools are simple, the tools are out there, but it's mostly about how you implement it and how you design the sessions, how you brief the moderator, and how you basically leverage what you have at hand. Awesome, awesome. I love it, I love it. Uh, I think uh, I, we definitely need to talk about, yeah, how do you properly brief moderators to using tools? Because no matter what the tool is, it seems like that, that can, the tool can live and die by the moderator, right? Uh, but before we get into that, um, I want to start off with uh, a really quick question, and then we're already starting to get audience questions, and so we will definitely jump into those. Um, but first, let's define audience engagement. If in one sentence you had to define what audience engagement is, and or maybe what it should be, what would you say that would be? So, uh, Uriah, you want to kick it off? Yeah, why not? So, uh, for me, like audience engagement, it's like a bedrock 
of a successful event. You know, like without, without keeping participants engaged, basically none of the content that the presenters are trying to basically deliver will stick. And that can actually undermine the reason why we actually organize the, the conferences between, because you know, there are numerous, there are various studies that confirm the number one reason why people still uh, you know, attend conferences is to learn. And if we don't engage people, they will not learn, uh, which as I said, like undermines the main reason why we actually organize uh, those events. And if you think about it, there's just so much content out there. So as event organizers, we are actually competing with YouTube. We are competing with TED Talks. We are competing with uh, Khan Academy. And I think from, the, from this perspective, um, the audience engagement is that something that the recorded video can't really provide uh, to people. So, you know, for, for us, it's, a, it's actually, um, it's really an added value. It's, it's something that we should really focus on creating that interaction, creating that space where people can ask the speaker the very specific questions that otherwise they can do in, a, in the online environment. I love it. I love the what the video can provide because I mean, like so many days in, it, in these days, people talk about, oh, well, why do I, I why would I live stream my event? Attendees won't show up, or why would I offer the recordings? People are just going to download the recordings afterwards. But I think you hit it right on the head, Sam. Well, if you had to define audience engagement in one sentence, what would that be for you? Yeah, I, I mean, and I kind of refer to the definition, right? And you know, there's obviously engagement when they talk about the use the word engagement, that's like getting married or whatever. But then there's this other definition. If you look down in two or three and, you know, like in the Cambridge Dictionary, you get the process of encouraging people to be interested in the work of an organization. And when I think about how does that apply in events, right? How do you apply that? You're, you're talking about dialogue. If you look at, if you listen to your eye talk, right, he talked about this dialogue between a speaker or a brand, right? and their audience. And so, so audience engagement um, with a lot of events and a lot of event planners, they think about in the room, what happens in the room, but it's also in physical spaces too, or at the social party or wherever it is. And so how do you create that dialogue, if you will? And, and your eye hit it right on the head. Um, you need to, we're at the age of meeting design. There's tools. We have tools to make people successful, but then they have to think about what's the conversation they want to create. And, and the, some, some data that we like to ref, you, uh, talk to people about or get them to think about is the following. And that, first of all, um, according to, you know, some of these books out there and some of the research, attendees stop paying attention after 10 minutes, right? Most of your conference sessions are 60 minutes. So you lost them six times. And online, it's even less, right? So you, some people say seven seconds. Some people say two minutes. doesn't matter. It's 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 fast. Um, I think the second thing that, that's out there is that lecturing and learn lecturing where it's just talking is the least effective form of learning, right? And so if that's true, right, then, and people stop paying attention, then you're really in trouble and you need to think about that. But what we like to ask people to do, and I'm sure your eye is doing this too in the meeting design part of their business is saying, look at your agenda. How much of your agenda is people sitting and listening? Right. And, and what you'll find is it's four to six hours. Right. A lot of people have it for four to six hours. And what you really want to do, if you can, if you want to change the course of your event and really reinforce the learning or to create a dialogue to reinforce your results, maybe your outcome isn't about teaching people. Maybe your outcomes are about transforming your business to, you know, we have a new strategy and we want to go this way. We used to go that way. Now we're going this way. And you want people to share ideas around that. Right. Then, you need to think about how do you tap into all of their MBAs and PhDs and all these high degrees that they have, right? Because people aren't coming to your conference to get filled up. They're coming to, they have a lot of extra brain capacity and, and cognitive resources to contribute. And so um, I know I've answered beyond this question, but it, I, I think some of that, these kinds of statistics are important. They stop paying attention after 10 minutes. We mostly have conferences. They're four to six hours of listening. And if we can work on how can we create these conversations with people, um, then what we can transform as, as event, you know, the events can become very transformational for an organization, not just as a learning tool, but also as a, as a collaboration tool. And, and, you know, there's lots of different types of events. So 
I love it. I, I think you guys answered uh, like in a good, not only just what is it, but also why it's important at the same time too, because um, like you talked about, Sam, there's literally a huge chunk of time that we're just sitting and listening. If we don't get people engaged that, you know, 60, 40 to 60% almost, because if you consider like a 10 hour day, maybe, you know, is lost. It's gone. Like they're, they're, they're just going to sit there. So what I wanted to ask you guys next is, you know, you guys started asking about this and it sparked up some questions from the audience um, is they want to know, you know, what is their role in the engagement? We talked a little bit about the moderator's role too. So maybe feel free to weave that in, but what's the planner's role in, in doing this engagement? Or is it just solely up to the presenters? You know, who, who's, res who's ultimately responsible for this and how do we make sure that the, the audience engagement continues to happen? So yeah. Sam's going to you, your eye, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, basically, I was thinking about it recently and I came uh, with a musical analogy, actually. And uh, if you think about the role of the event planner, you can, com you can sort of liken him or her basically to a composer. Somebody who, you know, writes a symphony. Uh, but once the basically curtain goes up, um, the event planner loses all the control over how basically the orchestra is going to play that symphony. And you need to have a conductor and that's the facilitator or a moderator. Um, so that's why also the briefing of the moderator are, is so important because, you know, as, a, as somebody who wrote the symphony, you just want it to, to have it performed in the way that you basically imagined. Um, so that's why basically working hand in hand with a facilitator or with a moderator is so crucial. So to address your question, the meeting planner basically writes a symphony, which is the agenda, which is the sessions, and you want to make sure that they align with the goals that you try to achieve. But once again, once the curtain goes up, it's actually the conductor, it's the moderator who basically performs the whole symphony. Ooh, can I, I love that analogy, fantastic. Go ahead, Sam. Can I just build on that a little bit? Um, and, and I think there are some meeting planners out there that um, they, they have the opportunity to work with um, people in whether it's in HR or in marketing or in organizational development or senior leaders. And those are the real content people, right? And so I, I believe it's also to the meeting planners that are listening today to, to really think about how can you bring new ideas to those folks and get them to think about some new things like some of those stats I shared, or, you know, here's another thing about audience engagement. Um, that, that I think that I think if I were a planner, that would be valuable, right? What, what are you trying to get people to do, right? And, and this is something a planner can take off to one of these other content people, right? You know, ask, and I think it needs to be an action verb. The people need action, ask, answer, pull, um, play, capture, collect. And these are some of the words I heard from Yuri and some of the, I have on a list, vote, share, post, right? These are, you know, these words. And so if they were going to frame things in those words with that, that kind of those kind of action words, I, I think would be valuable to them. Right. Um, and, and they don't, you know, the planner doesn't have, doesn't get to control all of that because as Yuri said, the speaker has a role or it's in a, it's in a physical space. So maybe it's self-directed and self-service or self-driven by the, by the people. Um, but, but they can, but if they can use those types of words and they can design that, but share that with the content creators, you know, the senior leaders that, that do this stuff, you know, they don't, they don't have time to learn about the best techniques for engaging the audience. Right. But that's what the event planner can bring back, bring back to those folks. I love it. I love it. I think you guys both made a, a super duper solid point about, you know, how as much as about the onsite, as it is the pre-planning portion. And what I found most of the time when it comes to these tools is that you can do all the pre-planning. You can hand guides over. You can tell them to watch a million videos, but they're still going to show up. Everyone's going to show up and say, I don't know how to use this. Show me how it's going to use it. And like one thing I think I would offer as a recommendation, the best people I've ever seen that, that know how to use tools are the ones that are flexible on site that you can explain to them in 30 seconds how Slido works. And, you know, and they basically are like, oh, I get it. And then they see it on screen and they get it and they can explain it really easily versus, you know, the ones that aren't flexible a little bit harder. Go ahead, Sam. Well, and to that point, to that specific point, you know, you only have 15 seconds or 30 seconds with people. And so you need to use a pattern that they understand, right? So like, in a, whether it's a, whatever you're doing, something simple that they can understand. And I think that's where, um, that, that part is super important so people can just get it and go. They don't need all this complexity. I've had some folks come to me and say, 
and I'm sure Yuri sees, Yuri sees this all the time, that they're like, yeah, we got an event app, and it's got too many menus to get to just, we want to pull and ask them Q&A questions, and it's so hard. And I, and I just hear this all the time, and it's just like, yeah, I wish they would just focus on doing something simple rather than trying to do something, com you know, trying to solve all the world's problems because they're missing out on the true value, which is getting responses from the audience or creating dialogue with the audience. And so, so simple is better. I believe exactly what you just said, Will. So. Yeah. Just to, just to add to what, uh, what you said, Sam, and also you, Will, that um, exactly as you said, like facilitation is – you do it live basically. So you need to be able to think of on, on, on your feet, so to speak, but also be flexible in terms of how you can react to those specific situations. Um, but also talking about exactly as you said, Will, that you can share videos, you can share articles and guides and all these kind of stuff basically prior to the event. But um, from, the, from the perspective of how well the tool, um, Slido or anything else is adopted, one thing is critical and it's, the briefing right before the session, right before the kickoff. Because, you know, I speak as a speaker or as a moderator, you have just so many things on your mind when you are about to step on the stage. Like, you will not really remember that, you know, two weeks ago somebody sent you an article about the Slido. So actually approaching the speaker or approaching the moderator and just giving him a very quick reminder, by the way, can you actually tell the audience that they can submit the questions for this session? Like you did actually at the start of this show, um, just letting them know that this, there is this option that can really make or break that session. Because if you don't let them know, they will not know. So yeah, it's a lot about, you know, uh, from the even planner's perspective, it's a lot about coordinating on site in real time. And uh, from, the, from the moderator's or speaker's perspective, being able to sort of react, um, yeah, promptly and adopt those to, to that To that point, I just want to keep building if it's okay, Will. Keep to going. That, to exactly what he just said, um, what your I just said. When you build, um, when you let your speakers create a call to action from the stage, you're going to get better results, right? And so, so when, whenever we find that even if you stand up and say, tweet to the hashtag now during a presentation, you're going to get a Twitter spike. We have data that shows there's Twitter spikes that the speaker does that. And it's, you know, but it seems so to a lot of folks are like, oh, no, we had it on a slide. No, 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 it's not about the slide. It's about the moment. This is a good point. Tweet it now with this hashtag. And, and that's what gets your results. In the same way, as your I said, when, this, when the facilitator says, send in some questions, and then they read the first question, and everyone, and what we find is that everyone sits there and goes, that was a terrible question. Who, who, that's, that's awful. I got five that are better than that. And they submit all their questions or comments or whatever it is they're going to do. But, but if you don't start that, you will not get that kind of outcome, right? And you have to get that, use those calls to action from the stage. I, I think that's, yeah, super, super tip. Um, one more thing that was also important, um, Uri said, and this is for everyone listening, Uri said this, that, if you send out the documents two weeks in advance, everybody's going to forget them. I cannot tell you how valuable that is. I cannot tell you. We do almost all of our, we do what's called an on-site preparation meeting in our work. We hardly ever go on site with our clients for their games or whatever. There's stuff they can all manage and whatever. But, but we do that meeting right before they go on site. And do you know why? Because every day before that we do it earlier, then the day before they go on site, they're likely to forget. And then they're like, oh, I don't know what to do. It's because they forgot. So we do it right before they go on site. And it, small detail, but it helps them remember. And like in our stuff, and probably like yours, there's not really, it's not that complicated, but just because the time went by and they, their kid got sick and they had a Veterans Day performance and whatever, all these 50, 100 other things to do, they forgot. So anyway. So if you're listening, if there's anybody online listening, these are, there's some really hot tips going out here. <laughs> I think they're listening for sure. I think they're listening for sure. Um, one, one quick uh, question we have from the audience, uh, Nick Borelli out in the audience, who many of you know as an uh, awesome guest of our show, uh, asked you know, about apps. You mentioned apps really briefly, so I figured we'd segue to this. He wants to know why can't anyone figure out a way to make an event app that's engaging year-round, right? Like a ton of people have tried this. Uh, everyone designs them. 
and they work, you know, maybe a month after the show, maybe a month before, and then completely die off. Why can't event apps continue to live beyond the experience of the events? Uh, and I know that's a very deep question, so feel free to. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think it's, a, it's, it's at least a $1 million question, if not more, honestly. Like, uh, yeah, exactly as you, as you said. Like, there are so many companies that try to figure this out, but um, that's um, one, one, one thing that I believe that um, people didn't really get this, um, sort of didn't crack this problem, is that you need to have a critical mass, honestly. Uh, in order to sustain that community, um, and there are some com there are some events or companies that are doing it right, but they sort of you know work with the community all around the year. So, for instance, um, startup grind events. Have you heard about them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a little bit. Explain like, what it is. Yeah, so basically that's the largest network for even professionals. So they've got their headquarters in uh, San Fran. And uh, they host the annual conference or biannual conference over there once or twice a year. And then they have um, basically a smaller events in, in the different cities, you know, across the States, across Europe, across Asia. And in this way, they are able to, you know, sort of work with the community of entrepreneurs in those particular cities. The same thing that happens, uh, that, that, um, that the similar te technique or tactics uh, is done by social media week actually they have a very uh, lively uh, blog basically um where they post a lot of comment and then they you know host the large events over there but bringing this back to the app or to the platform i think you need to have that critical mass in order to sustain it you know i it, now i don't agree i um i, I disagree with I you but that's but that's okay um i don't think it i um, but just because I don't agree, doesn't I don't think you're wrong. I think you're you're right. But what I what I see all the time is the following: is that the the group that's responsible they do their event, and then they move on to the next thing, and so the event is just one touch point with a larger community, and they use other tools to to maintain that contact with those communities. So what they might do at the event is you know could be whatever whatever they're whatever they're doing with that whether it's so if it's a leadership conference so we work with some pharmaceutical companies are doing leadership conferences and they're talking to their top leaders the event app isn't their communication vehicle with that audience year round right that's just their communication vehicle for that particular on-site activity so its role is to create communication while we're there because we don't have another tool and you know if they could figure honestly um there's some other communication tools they're using like Slack and some of these other things that they could figure out how to get an agenda in there and how to show data on a screen. They would do that instead. Right. That's what I, that's what I've seen. You know, there's, they, they could, they don't care about like the stuff that we're doing, polling, whatever they don't, they don't mind that that's extra, but they would have the regular dialogue inside that, that, that app. And so, so, so first of all, you know, Nick, I, the, what I see in all these corporate kinds of events is that it's not the communication tool all the all year round, right? They have other tools for that. They have email, they have blogs, they have distribution lists. And if it's customer based and they're talking to their customers, and I do a lot of B2B work, in those cases, they also have other tools. What they're, they care about is how well does that connect to their CRM platform? Can I get it into Salesforce? Can I get it into HubSpot? Can I get it into Sugar? And from there, they have drip campaigns that are set up and scheduled, right? And so then they're using other tools to, to, to communicate. Or it go, it's, so that's at the marketing level, but if it goes into the sales level, it's getting to the reps. So this idea of an event app all year round I don't even think it needs to be something that you really want to think about right now. Could you ask the question, should, do we need to have a new branded app for every single event? Whole other question. But I, what I used to believe, I used to be a big believer in this event app and you could have it engaging all year round. But the reality is, is after working with so many fortune 500 companies and so many different agencies, that's just not, it's not their common standard communication tool. They just, have so many other vehicles this is really becomes a tool they only use for a specific purpose right on site at an event so. yeah actually sam i perfectly agree with you i'm probably i didn't uh, you know uh, basically uh, set it right or uh, i meant the critical mass 
in the tool actually that's that's ah, exactly yeah. what you said um as, exactly following up on 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 the networks that are or on the communication tools that they're using exactly once you get back basically from the event you automatically switch to slack uh or to to your gmail or any other you know platform mm -hmm. that you're using and if you are a part of a certain community then it's probably on quora or it's on linkedin or it's in a private whatsapp group or it's a private an association uh, something slack, like that. exactly yeah. and stuff like that yeah absolutely i absolutely agree with you so it's now, a big big challenge but your example, but one of the things you did bring up was a really interesting example, though, right? Of this, and I didn't know the community, but but you've got if you have a community that has an international event, and then you do a series of regional events, and you push everyone to communicate and collaborate in that same app tool, right? Then you can win and be successful, right? And I think that can be that can be cool. But but for ninety percent of the people, that's that's not reality. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So basically, what I think you are trying to recreate a platform that already has that critical mass, be it LinkedIn or anything else, well, you know, company email, right? Exactly, exactly. And it's a, it's a pretty, pretty tough thing. And uh, as I mentioned, social social media week, I think they're, they're pretty successful with this one, because they managed to get that critical mass on their separate platform. Yeah. Uh, they got a, you know, I guess, um, hundreds of thousands of readers, you know, of their blog, and then basically they bridge it and they, you know, take the only can use and if they can use the same app at all of those concurrent events, and yeah. and over time then that drives value for why should i have the app why should i turn on the alerts why should i use it otherwise like i'm kind of with apple like all these guys and their apps and they're only use them for two to three days like who wants all of that who has time for all that download it and then throw it away my, my wife goes to goes to a, a, two events a week in the fall and in the spring she doesn't she doesn't want their apps right she doesn't care I remember the last event app I actually downloaded <laughs> All right, sorry, I shouldn't, you know, someone's probably mad at me now and No, you're good. We slandering me on Twitter for saying who cares. <laughs> no, you're good. I like controversial topics. So, um, you know, we're getting lots and lots of questions coming in. Um, one from the audience real quick. Um, oh gosh, I should read this before I read it out loud. Does anyone know if Ted, which maintains ma maintains an app with constant new content year round, have a separate should have a separate app for its events? Oh, which event? Which app maintains an app? I think the question is, do they, can, do they have a separate app for their event separate from the one that they post their content in? Should they do that? Do you guys think they should do that? Let's say if that, that let's do, treat that as a question. Well, I'll, I know some people that go to TED and, and I haven't talked to them about this in a while, but, but one of the things that I thought was really interesting was how that community works together and how exclusive it is, right? I'm not talking about the TEDx and all that. I'm talking about TED itself. And so... Um, so I'm not sure what they're doing, but I, I think that, um, part of their value is creating these networking opportunities for, for this exclusive community who gets an invite, right. And to be able to get invited to that and you have to pay a lot, right. But, um, that you should get that. So in that case, I would want to actually have an app just for those people, right. If they thought that was also going to be to our point, it's some tool they're going to use to communicate all year round and keep collaborating, not just here, let me just push out content. Cause I think those people that are on site, you know, they're high, typically high net worth individuals maybe. Um, and also highly creative people, right? So they come from a diverse collection of industries. You know, that, to me that the power there is, is in the network. Ooh, I like it. I like it. You're right. Anything else you want to add to that? No, absolutely. And I think to a certain extent, we are moving from these like uh, open social media networks to more closed ones. As I just mentioned, you know, you want to, you want to have 50, um, you know, friends or 50 uh, other professionals with you on the on a separate Slack, uh, you know, basically community and communicate over there. Um, or you want to have a separate WhatsApp group where you can share the knowledge with one another, you know, in the group that's been already, you know, close and it's sort off and, and can, you know that they can bring you a lot of value. So I think this is going to be a big challenge basically for marketeers in the future because people will be, you know, forming these kind of uh, um, sub-communities on the, on, on the open social media networks. So, so, I'm sorry, uh, social networks. Um, so I think there is going to be this shift moving this way. And obviously we will be sharing stuff but um, I think more and more of these like a sm smaller close-knit uh, communities will be popping out. 
I love it. I, I think especially yeah, with Facebook groups, for example, making yeah. it so there's more and more Facebook groups. Yeah, I think the nicheness yeah. of the groups is exactly. definitely going to uh, to occur more. So got another audience uh, question coming. I think this is a great one. Um, how do we measure audience engagement? Um, and what is considered, I mean, maybe even tie this in, what is considered success um, based on those metrics that you would see? Uh, for example, if you have any events that you've seen, how they measured it, and then how, what was considered successful to them. Uh, Sam, if you want to kind of kick it off, how, how do you guys usually, would you measure it? Does it depend on the apps that you're using? Does it depend on the conference itself? I know I've seen, maybe if you can provide a couple examples of how that you would measure it. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I might, you know, we, we have, we have lots of different dashboards for the different kind of activations, but let's just say it's in a trivia example. I had an event just recently and um, I think they had, 350 people play 1,200 trivia games and answer 22,000 trivia questions, right? So that's, that's, that's your number, right? Um, I have um, uh, other clients. Um, I had a client in a 10 by 10 small booth. Um, they had um, 75 people interact in their kiosk, at, uh, the thing we built for their kiosk in a booth and they collected um, 86 surveys from that, right? So 75 leads and 86 survey responses, that's their data, right? Um, the, another thing that we'll see people do, um, I've heard we do, you know, like in our prize wheel, um, I'll have clients like Delta and people like that, you know, they'll have, um, they'll ha they'll have a prize wheel and they'll have five kiosks set up and they'll give away a thousand prizes. Right? So these are different hard number measures of things, right? Um, we'll look at, and when we get into the audience response side of things that we do, um, we'll have people that um, we will measure questions. Um, we do topic-based idea generation. So we have people submit questions, but we also do topic-based idea generation. And so then we'll measure how many ideas were, that were created and then how many of those, I, and then if there's voting, is there everyone can vote, five votes, one vote, whatever, what were the votes? How many surveys were submitted, right? You can measure all of those kinds of things. Um, and so those are some good measures of engagement. I don't think all of those are good measures of the business value of your meeting, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and, and when you get to the part at the end, we have an article where we pulled together 43 business value measures of meetings, hard and soft measures, but those are some of the ways we measure that audience engagement, right? With the trivia, with the prize wheel, with the fish bowls, with the social media, oh, social media activation. Here's a really cool one. And, and your eye will like this. I'm positive. So what everybody shows in social media is everyone says how many tweets were there, how many photos, how many whatever, right? And they might break it down by Twitter and Instagram and whatever, SMS, break it all down that way. But what we look at, we, we do that too, right? So you get a nice graph for your boss and you can share that. But, but there's some really important chart. We look at what's called a participation chart. And we look at how many times did people participate? Because what we find is that you might get a number that says 20,000 people, there was 20,000 tweets on our hashtag. Yeah, right, and everyone gets excited. But, but it, how does an event planner improve the event, right? How do you improve the event based on that number? You don't know. What do I, what do, I do? Is that good, bad, and how do I make it better? So what we look at is, is, is participation. So we can say, well, there was 20,000 tweets, but 80% 80, 80 of those people only participated one time. Mm -hmm. Some percent participated two or five times. So you are Mr. and Mrs. Planner, you need to start, yeah, 10,000 tweets by Alex, right. But then you, <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Planner, what you need to look at is if you look at participation, how can you change your calls to action? We already talked about this earlier, calls to action from the stage, right? And your signage and all the things you do to help get better results. And so, so those are some things that a planner can actually take action on, right? Cause it's also one thing to have numbers, but then how do you take action on it? Right. And make it better. Anyway, that's a lot of different kinds of statistics. Sorry about that. Uh, that's awesome. I, I think that the, the, the measurement per attendee is very, very important, like you said, because sometimes people just look at engagement as a whole, but you don't realize that you have these like super engagers that it's like the 80-20 rule, that 80% of the engagement was from 20% of the people. So, well, um, and we, we also look at um, another statistic. Uh, it, it's not a, we don't have good data. We don't collect data this way. Sorry, sorry, you're right. Just as I want no, to no, no, don't worry. Continue. It's very interesting. And uh, yeah. Continue. All right. So one of the things we look at is also how do you measure participation, right? 
or, or the types of people. So in a lot of events, you know, they, they really focus on that. Well, we didn't have a hundred percent of the people participating and they get really upset and they're sad and they're depressed that only 80% of the people responded to the poll questions. Who cares? It, when we, we look, we use some, some data analysis that says that there's a type of attendee called the creator. There's an attendee called the critiquer. There's an attendee called the collector. There's an attendee called, um, that just kind of listens, right? And, there, and there's about six attendee types and I forgot them all. But think about this. The number of people that create is a very small number, right? But the number of people that critique is three times that. Wow. So if you say creators are about 10%, but your critiquers are 30%, think about this. So and you've met these people, you give them a, a white piece of paper, a critiquer, right? You give a critiquer a white piece of paper and they're like, I don't know what to do with this. I got nothing. But if you give them your, your ebook that you spent all this time on and you've, it's 50 pages long and you spent all this time, they'll give you 40 pages back of redlined material and why that was the worst ebook ever written. And, and everybody out here who's listening knows they've met that person, right? And wanted to punch them in the nose. But, but really, in your event, that's a type of behavior. So if you can design an audience engagement experience that allows that person to participate, both of those people and work together, you can get some great results. And it doesn't have to be complicated either, right? It could be let people submit ideas, then let people upvote ideas. I think you do that, right? Your, your platform can do that. Yeah, so, so it could be, and so we like to look at it as, get people to create ideas and then let people, um, you know, whether it's vote or comment on them, whatever. But that's, that's allowing those two groups of people to work together where if you only did one or the other, you wouldn't get every, but you wouldn't satisfy everyone and make them happy. That's, interesting. Yeah, that's, a, that's a great point that you made over there, uh, Sam. And just to like to put the, the actual participation number in the context, you know, um, as you said, that some, some clients might be complaining, we get only 70% of the audience, you know, submit a vote but just think about it like um at without technology how many people would actually raise a hand and ask a question you know yeah. one two three out of 500 or, or out of thousand you know yeah. in this way you literally give a voice to every single one of them and that yeah. person doesn't need to be you know equipped with as you know uh, public speaking skills uh you know to ask that question so it's very empowering to actually think uh, just to give people that uh, that option to ask those questions. Well, you're but, really multi-threading it, right? Yeah, but I was I, I just wanted to mention one thing because these were like a you know a, a high level statistics and and the measurements of the engagement of the success. Um, I, I I wanted to take it a little bit on the on the tactical level. On uh, sometimes you know people wonder like was my se session successful? Did any of the content they tried to deliver actually resonate? It? And one thing that you can do, and I do it personally when I, when I speak, is that I run a simple poll at the start of the session, something in lines of, um, I have ideas to improve engagement at my, at my event. And I just create a star poll, basically, a, a, a rating poll from one, uh, very few, let's say five, a lot. And I get people to, you know, at the start of the session to vote how many they feel like. And I get a score, let's say, aggregate score of 3.5. I was like, all right, so I can see that some of you already have some ideas, some of you have a few less. Then I delivered the content and I ran the very same poll at the end of the session. And I usually I pray that the score actually goes up, but uh, if it does, um, it is one of the indicators that actually you manage to deliver some value to people. And if, if the score goes from 3.5 to four or 4.5, you know, we can conclude that the learning actually happened or at least you provided some kind of a value. And then one more thing that a lot of people are actually struggling with is the feedback forms. You know, it's a nightmare. If you ask an even planner, what about, how do you collect, you know, the feedback? Um, nobody opens the survey forms um, after the event or very few actually. So once again, uh, coming back to what we talked about, you know, uh, giving a calls to action from the stage. Don't do it after the event. Do it, do it midway through or do it at the end of your uh, event before actually people leave the physical room. And don't put 20 questions in there. Just make it super simple. Three, four questions, one open text poll, and just make this call to action. Guys, before you leave this room, please just fill in this survey. It's gonna take you 30 seconds and you're gonna get amazing insights. 
So, so I want to build on what, what, what he just said for everyone who's listening, the, the before and after, right. And, and there's an f- official name for that. If you, it's a, if you actually, you can do it the way he said it, there's also a one through seven scale and it's a Likert scale, I think. And so you measure, what do you know? And you can measure knowledge and then you can take that same measure and then measure them two weeks later and two or three months later. And then you can actually measure that, uh, kind of have a continuation of performance. So we've seen, it's that, that's a highly effective, simple and highly effective tool. So fantastic. But I think the other thing is about feedback forms, about the simplicity. We see, um, we see people that, that want to make these really complicated forms. And the problem is that actually people can't really differentiate between too many items, right? So they don't think about them as granular as we do. Mm-hmm. So we sometimes try to make your feedback too, too complicated, right? And you don't get the results you want because everyone just put four all the way down because they're like, it seemed like a four to me. And, you know, unless they were really upset, right? That's what they did. So one of the things that, that, that someone suggested to me, and, and I, you know, I just think this is a clever idea, is to ask, you know, did you, did you learn anything? Yes or no? And if yes, what was that one thing that you learned? And you give them an open text box, fill that out. Did you meet anyone new? Yes or no? And then the open text box is, and if, you know, if yes, so you have an open text box. And who, who are they and what are you going to do? What are your next steps with that, right? So you're kind of appealing to the learning aspect, but also that networking element as well. And like, you would get much better results and much better focus than asking, you know, was a room too hot or too cold? And, I, and I'm no offense if that's folks, I know you want to ask those questions, but you know, um, there's other, there, there's, there's other, there's some techniques that we can, you all can use to simplify your lives and your data, but also um, get great results that you can then take action on. And I think that, I think from what we're, our point of view, that it doesn't have to get so complicated. Right? Some great points. Maybe just to add one last thing about how to create effective surveys. And uh, we saw many uh, clients actually use this NPS score as part of the surveys. For yeah. those of you who don't know that, it's a net promoter score. It basically measures, let's say, the health of the company, how well uh, the company is actually performing. And if you're in a range of 50 to 50 percent, you're doing good. If you are 17 above. Uh, you're doing great. So you can ask a question like, how likely are you recommend this event to your colleague or a friend? Um, and you're going to give them a, a, you know, a, a scale of one to 10 and uh, all the answers, eight, nine, uh, one, they, they are just like, you count those and you basically sub- subtract uh, everything that is one to three. And I guess four, five, six, it's just a neutral and you're going to get a percentage at the end of the day, basically. And if you are in that range that I mentioned, 70 and above, 70 and, and above that's a great score. And it, it, it's going to give you a great idea about um, how well your conference or event is performing. Even easier. Do the net promoter score, like he said. Even easier. It's one question. That's all you need to know at the end of your session. It'd be great. There you go. Yeah. There you go. I love it. We're huge fans of NPS Endless, too. So uh, we use it for all people who you probably have gotten one if you watch this show right now. So, um, you know, really huge. And I love making that my first question and then following up with additional questions based on that because, you know, that you can find out, like, hey, if they're really detracting, they're probably going to be more vocal. Sometimes you find those passives, which are like in the middle. Um, it's again, you look up net promoter score, Google it, we'll add in the show of resources. You'll learn all about it. If you don't know about it, but passives, usually you find there's this like big chunk of people who just don't respond to it. They don't really care. They're like, whatever, like you want to get the feedback from the detractors and the, and the promoters. And that's where you can ask additional questions. Like how cold is it? Um, so, um, we're amazing. This is such a great topic. We're going over time already and I want to make sure I'm cognizant of your guys' time. So I'm going to ask our last two questions we ask everybody, but uh, I'm pretty sure these guys are going to be game in for part two of this. And we have so many questions lined up already from the audience and from what we, I want to ask that we're going to easily be able to do a part two on this episode. You guys are awesome. So, but before we do, we, we go into the end of the show, I want to ask our last two questions. So uh, if you guys had one tip, you know, whether it's audience engagement related or not, uh, that you would ask event planners, what would be your one tip for them to make their events more successful in uh, 2018 since we're getting closer to 2018? So uh, Sam, why don't you kick it off with your one tip? Um, that is a great question. Um, I guess the, um, 
if I had to, yeah, okay, I got one tip. Here it is. So a question we get asked a lot is, hey, we had a brainstorming session about audience engagement, and all we could come up with was polling. Can you help us with whatever else there's other choices there are, right? And my tip is the following. Um, I'm not gonna, I can give you a, long, a list of ideas. I think that's in our extra resources is a list of ideas. There's over 20, whatever. But what I do want to do is get you to think about this. I want you to think about, I want you to remember those attendee types I talked about, the creators, the critiquers, those folks first. So remember those different, different types of people. The second thing I want you to remember is when we said audience engagement, we talked about action words, right? Ask, answer, poll, vote, play, capture, collect, share, right? Those types of words. So keep that. And the third thing, this is the third thing that you need to do with my one tip, is when you do audience engagement, whatever you do, provide feedback. Because they're contributing, but give them some feedback back. If that can be visual, that's awesome. So maybe it's a, a big leaderboard, maybe it's a poll results screen, maybe it's a word cloud, maybe it's a social wall with everybody's pictures on it, whatever, a chart, you know, live chart or whatever. Whatever it is, give them feedback. It could be that it's feedback where you've got results from a game or whatever, and you're talking about what, why that, how that applies to learning and the, the key messages. Uh, you have your CEO talk about that, right, and reference that, that activity. That feedback loop, right, as well as the actions are all important to what your success will be. So if you want to succeed at audience engagement, and I only have one tip, my tip would be to think about the types, create the right actions, and then make sure you provide feedback. Amazing. I love it. I love it. You're right. What's your one tip? Um, my one tip would be get a great moderator. And let me tell you why. Um, because putting the burden of creating interaction or engagement on our speakers will not work. Why not? Because they are scared. Most of them, they are simply scared and they, they are driven by the fact that they need to deliver certain message or whatever they have basically on slides. For most of them, there are some amazing speakers, don't get me wrong, but for most of them, it's beyond their abilities actually to create the engagement. That's why it's so critical to have a great moderator who will basically facilitate that interaction for them, who will facilitate a great conversation, a great Q&A. If you use the tech platforms, that person is also going to be the sort of the champion of your audience, collecting all those questions that the people submitting then asking them the speaker. So really the role of a great moderator or a facilitator will be absolutely critical for the success of your future events. Awesome. So good. So good. Uh, I think your guys tips are just so amazing. Um, <laughs> all right. Making sure that we get wrapped up on time. I want to go into resources. Sam, you started mentioning some of the resources, but uh, if you guys had any books, blogs, um, apps, gadgets, Batman, cardboard cutouts that you want to mention with everybody. Uh, this is your kind of time to drop them. So uh, Sam, you kind of mentioned the list potentially. Um, any other resources yeah. you want to share as well? Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I think we put in um, socialpoint.io and I think it was, um, if you go to slide, if you go to www.socialpoint.io um, and you go in there, you'll find a, a blog, you'll find some eBooks. Um, you'll also find, and I think it's interactive meeting I don't know if it's interactive dash meeting. I would have to look it up. Yeah, interactive dash meeting. So, that's right. so socialpoint.io um, slash interactive dash meeting. It's, it's essentially a virtual ebook for audience engagement. Um, it's going to cover everything from the emotional connections that people have, some of these statistics I was talking about, the different types of people. Um, you're going to find 20 plus ideas. You're going to find 43 different ways to measure the business value of meetings, hard values, soft values. Why do people go to conferences? Blah, 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 stuff like that. And, and really what the reason we share that with you is to help you succeed. So if you find one thing and if you read it and say, this is awesome, but you can only implement one thing, then, then we think you're winning. And the better, you know, if you can create these conferences where, where you're creating engagement, um, then I, I think you've won. If you just hired a facilitator, like your I just suggested, you've won, right? Those are the things. If you just added 10 more minutes of dialogue rather than lecture, you win. Right, but um, but go to that those resources, borrow it, use it, print it out, use it to your share it with all of your stakeholders, and go go make your meetings better. Right, figure that out, and I think um, we've we've done this for a long time. So and in two continents, and uh, there's just 
a lot that you guys can benefit from. And we just want to share that and make you successful. Amazing. I love it. And yeah, we'll post all this in the resources section on the blog after the show. So um, we'll have that URL for everyone to go download that. So definitely go check that out. Uri? So really quick, uh, I'm currently reading a great book by Adrian Segar. Uh, he's really a pioneer of meeting design. And the book's name is, uh, the, the book name is um, The Power of Participation. Brilliant, brilliant hands-on techniques and a very practical advice that you can find over there. Another great book, uh, which is a little bit more theoretical, but it's going to give you a lot of food for thought into the heart of the meetings. Um, great stuff over there. Um, in terms of how to uh, sort of, you know, in, engage people and how to use technology for uh, improving the communication, we share a lot of case studies and a lot of practical tips at uh, blog.slide.do. Uh, um, so feel free to head over there. We just put together a, a sort of a, a guide or a resource uh, where we collated all these uh, stories of our clients and how they actually used Slido and moved beyond a simple Q&A. So um, a few tips from my side. Amazing. Um, I was going to recommend if anyone, Adrian is a huge, we're huge fans of Adrian. We've done an episode with him, episode 70 of Event Icons. We had Adrian on the show talking about uh, conference engagement. Uh, really, really, he's, he's awesome about that. So if you like the same kind of conversation, really, really great guy. They both apply him because they know he's a legend. Um, so yeah, so definitely uh, go check that out for sure. Um, my resource I have for all of you guys is completely on event, uh, event related, not related to events, but um, I had to try to think of something more recent uh, and a great site I recently found is thrifter.com um and it's the same guys as like windows central it's like that same blogging uh company and i never heard of this i've always been a big fan of kinja deals which is the life hacker group where they basically go like hey here's all the deals for today uh you know hue light bulbs are 50 percent off you can get usb cables for super cheap today thrifter is uh more extensive and they also do like ads analysis of black friday as we're getting closer to black friday and one thing i love is that they do something that not a lot of these other sites do where they just say like oh this is how much you're saving from list price but they actually do an analysis of these ads to say is this actually a good deal uh and and uh, so if you're doing any Black Friday shopping coming up, you want to save some time, thrifter.com does an analysis of all the major ads coming out and tells you what's a good deal and what's just mediocre and you can wait until another time to buy it. So um, check out thrifter.com. Completely unevent related, but new favorite That's site. Awesome. Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, awesome. Well, that brings us to the end of this week's episode. Again, it was so good. I, I hope you guys are willing to come back for a part two because we have tons of questions and I think we barely scratched the surface of this. And uh, I think everyone is clawing at the bit to ask you more questions. So uh, we really hope you guys come back for a part two. Um, but uh, until then, we have to say goodbye. So a big thank you, Uri and Sam. You guys have been absolutely amazing, literally dropping knowledge bombs left and right. Thank you guys both for being on the show. Thank you so much for inviting us, Will. Uh, yeah, thanks for having us. And Uri, it was, a pleasure to, it was a pleasure to meet you. I really enjoyed that today. One day we'll have to have a beer uh, live in person. Absolutely. Likewise. Cool. Pleasure to meet you, Sam. Awesome. Well, I have promoted the man, the myth, the legend, Alex Plaxon, who does all of our live tweeting and Facebook management during the entire show, who's going to kick us off a little DJ style. I see he's still muted right now, so I'm hoping he is still there to play out some outro music. So, Alex, whenever you're ready, feel free to kick it in with some uh, DJ drops. Thank you for joining us for another amazing episode of Hashtag Event Icons. To catch the transcription and all of the resources mentioned, head to www.helloendless.com slash blog. This week's episode will be posted and available by next Tuesday. Also, let us know what you thought about this week's episode. Share your biggest takeaway and join the Twitter conversation sponsored by Alex Plaxon and Little Bird Told Media. Just tag your post with Hashtag Event Icons. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you again for joining us. We'll see you next Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern right here on hashtag event icons.